had a camera issue or two where it stopped in the middle, so. Oh, no. <laughs> no, we've caught it. I've caught it because it makes a noise. Which okay. Is, yeah. After 200 and almost 90 of these. I was going to say, how many? Yeah. yeah 290. 290. 290 wow. episodes. Seven years. Yeah. Hard to believe. Yeah. This is our third interview. You know, it's been, believe it or not, 100 episodes since we talked. Is that right? 100 episodes. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So two years since I've been here. I guess yeah. two years since the last that show. That sounds about right. Yeah. Because yeah. I do one every week. So yeah. anyway, I have Jill Carver on. And uh, for the third time, and <laughs> the reason we wanted to, I wanted to have you on again is because you've done this beautiful body of work mm. for a show that we've been working on, and I thought primarily we'd just talk about that. Though we were talking about some other stuff too, and I'm going to just go back and talk about that before we go into okay. it, which was was drawing. So I have this Masters of Drawing show that's coming up, which you'll be a part of in February of next year. That's the first time anybody knows about it. So it's coming, folks. It's going to be terrific. Exciting. Because drawing is so important, I think, component of being an artist. Absolutely. Yeah. Regardless and, of style. Yes. Regardless Painting of style. Painting is, is drawing. And if yes. you can't draw right. um, using other tools, then you probably can't paint very well. So Yes. Yeah. And you worked at the National Portrait Museum in London, yes. right? Yes. Uh, for 12 years? 12 years. Yeah. Yes. See, ooh, I knew yeah. that. And <laughs> what, what what did you do when you were there? Because I think this deals with drawing. I'm just going to... Yeah, so part of my job was actually to be in charge of the prints and drawings collection, which was vast. I forget how many hundreds of thousands we had. So mm. the primary collection in the gallery, which did have some drawings in it, was 10,000 items, I mm. think, at the time. Um, and then I worked in the archive, and there we had... Um, preparatory drawings we had huge number of engravings so yeah part of my job was as collection management our department was collection management for those prints and drawings and mm. then a huge part of my job was to add those to databases because when I worked there you know compute when I started working there we were typing everything on typewriters right. and index cards <laughs> if you can believe that yeah, I and can then believe that. and then we yeah. transitioned to computers and then to databases so then it was a case of itemizing each item and doing catalog entries so that was a big part of my job too. so you got to handle thousands oh yes upon thousands. i can't even imagine how many i translated onto our database which is now totally accessible to the public you can go in and search those things. so when you're touching some master painting, yeah i mean there must have been at times you go oh my god yeah and yeah. you, especially if it went to a big painting right. that you knew was a major painting, you were like, oh, right. what's that like? I mean, yeah. really, how, I mean, I know for Dixon, when I see his things, I'm like, oh my gosh, I know yeah. what that was for, but what's that like? Well, certainly, you... you know, with the primary collection, I remember I was trained as an art handler mm. and managed some of the photography sessions at the gallery. Mm. And I remember when we got the coronation portrait of Elizabeth I out of its frame <laughs> to photograph. It's on three wooden panels. It's shaped like this. Yeah. You can hear the thing start creaking underneath the heat of the photographer's lamps, you know. But just to handle that to... I, I always used to, you know, in my mind, think of, you know, Elizabeth the first sharing the same airspace with that object and then myself mm. centuries later sharing the same airspace mm. as that object. It's magical. Yeah, maybe on I the... mean the hit you know, that's why I'm a history major from university. I just love the history. It's so important. Yeah. You know? People just yeah. I think collectors need to understand that the history is as important as it is the art in some ways. Right. You don't become who you are without your own history and the path that you took. And each little thing that you did in your life led you to where you are. Right. And which is a long way yeah. from growing up right. in England right. to living in Rico, Colorado. Right. Doing <laughs> Western, primarily Western, Southwestern, really, landscapes. Sure. For the most part. Right. I mean, I think that's a fair statement at yeah. this point in time. right? And I love the paintings as objects, I think, because I come from that history, mm. art history background where paintings are considered as treasured historical objects. Mm -hmm. I view my paintings as physical objects. You know, I want the whole thing to feel attractive. 
the frame. I want when mm. someone turns it over that, you know, I've left my mark there because I know from a provenance point yes. of view, it's really important that you mark that up yeah, and as you do. much as you possibly can. It's yes. got an inventory number. It's got signature in several places. Yes, yeah. I noticed that when I was it's looking at your painting, yeah. you know, because we were talking <laughs> about one little painting that you had signed. And it was when I asked, is that the back end of your brush? Mm. And you said, yes. And you were telling me how you don't want to your name to overshadow the painting, which right. I w love. Yeah. And so immediately I flipped over to the back to see as a historian as well, like, okay, would I be able to track this painting down right. if I couldn't read that a hundred years from now? Right. The answer is yes, because yes. you put on the back, what do you have? I mean, there's a whole essay. So there's, there's an inventory stamp there that um, corresponds to a ledger that I have at home. Yes. Um, so every painting is given a number. If it goes in a frame and goes out to a gallery, it's given a number. Signature in a couple of places. My business card is on there. And then also, because I do come from that art history background and I know how important provenance is, should a buyer collector choose to reframe it, all that information is also on the canvas stretcher. So ah. if the frame gets discarded at some point, it's still there on the, on the back of the stretcher. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. And so, how many? It's a little overkill, but, but that comes from you know, being a curator, sure. right? Yeah. That was it. Right? Yeah. When, so when you actively go, okay, I'm going to be a painter, and you come to the states, pretty much after that, right? You come to Texas, not too long after you left England. Did yeah. you did you start your inventory system at that point? No, I didn't. Um, it was actually Paul Bingham that gave me a real nagging and said, "You need to start doing this." Uh, yeah. So you I started. You know why? I can ledger. tell you why. Because of Dixon. Exactly. And Dixon yeah. had done it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I have that log. Do so, you really? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, you yeah. know, it's really interesting to look and see, you know, all the things that occur in a life. Right. Which is a lot. Right. <laughs> yeah. No, they're, they're important to do um, for sure. And I was looking through my ledger the other day and it's just like hundreds and hundreds of paintings now. And you just think, wow. I right. mean, I just look through it just to remind myself of some of the paintings that have been done. And do all paintings make it small or large? Is there a cutoff? You go, oh, this is a study. I don't put that in there. No, generally speaking, if it's going in a frame into a commercial situation at a gallery or a show, it gets a number. Mm. Yeah. And what about yeah. studies that are just obviously plain air things? Do you inventory no, they're those? No, in they're, they're in boxes in stacks. So I will say, as a historian, start numbering those at least with a date or something. So... When they go back to look at your work at some point in time, they go, right. oh, here, boy. Yeah. Oh, I mean, those studies, some of them are pretty raw and unfinished. I but... mean, it's dy <laughs> dynamite information for me. Yeah. Um, but would I want them out in the world? Maybe not, but they're important information for me. But as yeah. somebody who does research, right, exactly. you would go, oh, look, this yeah. is what she's doing. I yeah. understand. Right. In fact, we were talking about that earlier because I got to see your paintings for the first time. By the way, that's like... You know, that's like a kid in a candy store when an artist has been working on this. We talked about this almost a year ago, I think, right. during this show. Maybe right. longer even. I yeah, don't a year know. and a half, I think. Yeah, I did the been... first trip to the Grand Canyon a year and, and a got half. hold of you okay. and said, I have seen yeah. some magic and yes. I want to do something with this. So yeah. it's a year and a half right. of work. Right. So you bring it in for the first time. I mean, I've seen it on, you've sent me photos. Not the same. It's not the same. Not I, even the same. I feel like that. I'm taking the photographs and I'm tweaking them and yeah. editing them to match the original and particularly someone that paints with thicker paint yes it just doesn't convey in a digital yeah. photograph it, they're just juicier and and so i was know. looking at a little maybe 12 by 12 mm -hmm. something which which is a it's really almost has this abstract sensibility with the orange and blue and i asked joe why do i like this painting so much and you said because it's orange and blue. blue. And did you, yeah, you know, I like those colors. What I can do, I say? Yeah. Are they all around you? Right. All, I and don't the know. shirt. Yeah. Just look at the shirt. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm pretty open book, I guess. But it was more than that for me. Yeah. It really was because I was trying to, I know internally I like those colors, but I was looking at that painting trying to figure out why is this thing just making, doing it for me? And it literally is the, it's, it, and I took it and I turned it each way, upside down, sideways, and it works all ways. Right, right. And then I was my question was, you know, was this a plain air? You know, and you go, no, this is was three little 
I did on that Mojave Point sunset. I did two, two. Um, on consecutive evenings, and that's how I like working. Yeah. You know that light. Maybe you can pre predict it coming for thirty minutes, and you get set up and you get a rough drawing put in there. And, and drawing is via paint. For me, yeah, on yeah. site, it's yeah. it's via paint. Um, but then I quit as soon as I I'm not out there trying to produce finished pieces. I'm out there trying to get real information as I see it. Right. So once that light's gone, I'll pack up and do something else. But I love coming back the subsequent night. You know, so there's two studies for that. If you were to look at them, there's still bare canvas. It's still quite raw, but there's the information is there for that. And you're piece. literally trying to cut to capture color hues, emotional sense of what that moment was. Right. And whatever small geometric information that you can get right yeah. yeah and and that particular scene um it's really interesting to me how the chroma and saturation out there at sunrise and sunset change i mean i i think you see that here in tucson skies mm. too mm -hmm. it just depends what's in the atmosphere right is there dust is there moisture has the air cleared out and there's zero percent humidity right. like all of those elements have an effect on how chromatic and um, you know, define the light and the shadow planes are mm -hmm. changes all the time. So that's why I love going back instead of trying to finish a painting, mm. just go back and do a new study. You know, the next evening, and, and when uh, you did, see see something else. Yeah, and you when know? you did that little painting, it's a small mm. painting, and you went back two consecutive mm -hmm. evenings. Yes. Did you do? Other paintings from that, or was it just for that little painting? It was just for that little oh painting. Oh my God, that's amazing. Because I don't, I just go to Grand Canyon to study, right? At that point, I really don't have it in my head mm. that a studio piece is going to come from it. Mm -hmm. I'm just there trying to learn, you know. And it was only when I was back in the studio, you know, the show really split into these two narratives. It was either weather interacting with the land mm -hmm. or it was light and shadow patterns interacting with the geology and the form and the structure. Mm. And uh, that was kind of, I think that was the second piece in where I thought I really want to push the chroma here. Mm. And, um, and the show know, has both. It has both. It has both things. themes going yeah. on, yes. Yeah. So when you're there sitting... You're standing on the edge. <laughs> yeah. Are you okay? Are you standing? Yes. Standing. And with yeah. your and you do you have your easel set mm -hmm. up? Mm -hmm. Are you in that moment where you're really being in the moment? Yes. Where you're trying to absorb smells, sound, oh yes, light, yeah, texture, right, lines, mass, and but then ignoring the tourists. <laughs> yeah. No, like you have you to. Like you really want to just focus. It's you a know, meditative process. It is, yeah. yeah. So you have to kind of zone. You want to embrace all those natural sounds and the ravens yes. cackling. I love out there. They've got yes. a whole range of different noises that they make depending yes. on their mood. And I love all of that. Yeah. And, and when you smell. get that input, that sensory input that's coming in, then you, you're basically your mind can hone in to the moment right. and to absorb Right. what you're really trying to capture from that second that you're doing it when you're there in very being very present to translating that to right. something that you can now go back to in your studio and go I'm back there right the studies are gold mm. in terms of getting back there yeah but I also write prolific notes and I don't know if every artist does that but I just love writing my thoughts and reactions down. And I'll tend to paint while the light is what I want to capture. Right. And then say I have another hour before it's pitch black, I'll sit down and I'll just write notes mm. about what it was I was trying to capture, what it was I saw, maybe try and identify the value range because the photos mm. don't convey that. Um, and and I, you find, take I find my notes are really... <clears throat> important in getting my mind back to that it's not just the studies and the photo references it's the written notes and you do take some photos at the same time oh yeah, yeah. for sure yeah so photos studies notes and the, the notes, notes when yeah. you go back into the studio yeah. to now paint this little 12 by 12 right do you read your notes first i do and i'm surprised by how much is in there that if you just ask me to memorize that moment and get back to it in the studies there's certain things certain relationships that i picked up that i wouldn't have remembered 
Mm. So yeah. Have you ever thought about putting the notes with the paintings? It was interesting because I think was it Howard Post or Ed Mel you were talking about where this they wanted the painting to stand on its own two feet and not not have their signature, not have their story with it. You know that once you release it into Howard the Post. world, it's kind of that's a Howard Post. It's out there and it belongs yeah. to everybody else and it's no yeah. longer yours. But um, certainly when I posted that tree painting on social media and told the story of you know gathering the information for that people were like that story has to go with the painting yeah let's talk about so, that yeah. so this is a one of the major paintings of the show and it's a piece that is a single tree and you know with the focus on the tree in the foreground and then the canyon behind it's a very you know, as I told you, a very Mary Russell Farrell Colton kind of sensibilities to me. Interesting, yeah. For me. Yeah. Um, she did one called The Lonesome Hole that is very similar with a tree, and I guess that's why okay. you'll have to look at it. It's in the Phoenix Art Museum now. I have the study for it, which is beautiful. Took Didn't have the tree in the study. I'd like which, to see which that. Which is very yeah. interesting. Yeah. Um, but tell us about, because I know the story, because I read it on, it was Instagram or Facebook? Both of them, yeah. 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 So one of them, anyway. Right. Post, yeah. So tell tell about what went into making this painting. Well, I first seen I didn't actually tell the whole story on social Good. media because it would have been yeah. quite long. Let, we have time. My first <laughs> trip there in August twenty three, I had seen this tree right on the rim, and I know there's a, a ton of very lyrical, you yes. know, juniper trees along the right. rim, but I had taken photos of it absolutely convinced I would remember where it was. And I loved it because it had two prominent branches that were like outstretched arms. Embracing. Yeah, like greeting the day, mm -hmm. you know? And I'd taken a bunch of photos of it and of course stupidly hadn't written down where that was. So my second trip there <laughs> was fine. that happened four months later, I was like, I want to find that tree. And I was chatting to some tourists, and I was like, yeah, yeah. They were like, what are you up to? And I said, well, I'm painting. I'm trying to find this tree. And they were like, do you have any idea where it was? And I was like, somewhere on the south rim. <laughs> <laughs> somewhere on the south rim. So that was my first uh, motivation. Of course, the background gives it away. And as soon as I got back there, I was like, it, it has to be out to How long did it take you to find it? Hopi Point. I think a couple of mornings, you know, and then when I did, it was like greeting an old friend, yeah. you know, like there it is, you know. Um, but there's this magical moment where, you know, so that view in the painting is looking west mm. and that tree is right on the edge of the rim. Behind me is a bunch of, you know, rim scrub cedars and junipers and the sun is rising through them. So you get these little hot spots of light hitting the tree mm. but then as a second narrative you you have you know the Hopi point with that glimpse of the Colorado River and mm. you have the sun coming down at the same time these hot spots of light hitting the tree these little filtered mm. holes of light coming through um, so obviously it happens very early I was staying in uh, Yafapi Lodge which is one of the easternmost lodges so it was two buses across the park with my kit um so essentially i was getting up at 4 30 and just you know we were talking earlier about showing up and just using muscle memory to get you someplace you know mm -hmm. <laughs> just get on the bus you know <laughs> get, on get the, the coffee get on the bus and i would get out there and i'd have about 30 minutes before that sun started lifting mm -hmm. you know the light in the valley and um so i did that I, I just went and observed the first morning and then I went back two mornings when the light was kind of where I wanted it to be, you know, no clouds and uh, did two studies, you know, 40 minutes each again, unfinished mm -hmm. and again, different feel each, each time. Sometimes the tree was feeling quite neutral and the Canyon was on fire, mm -hmm. you know, so it was that balance. And I, and in my notes, I was like, there's, there's different options here on what wins and what has to kind of be subdued a little mm. bit. You know, there's different um, concepts available. And that first day you just go and observe. I did, yeah. And that's like 40 minutes, an hour of yeah. just, what are, you, what are you trying to? I'm just sitting on yeah. the rock, just paying attention. Mm. You know, what's being happening. Present. Yeah, being present. I knew what had, it was the shape of the tree that had appealed, but I knew it was the close 
color relationships between the shadow and the light on the tree and the shadow and the light in the canyon behind. They were very, very closely related. <clears throat> so I was definitely going with that question in my head. You know, I know they're closely related. That's why I responded to that scene. But how? How does this play out? Mm. Yeah. And so when you came back the next day, as the sun's rising. Just painting. Yeah. yeah. You kind of go, okay, I know what I need to do now. Right. Yeah. I know what it is. Right. And, and you get what you can get, which is only lasts 45 40 minutes. 40 minutes. Yeah. 45 minutes. And that's yeah, assuming and then, you have good weather. <laughs> and then I stop. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. I was only going out there, you know. Um, like if it was 4.30 and it was cloudy and raining, I couldn't see stars out of my lodge room, then I wouldn't go. <laughs> yes. And so how long was the trips that you did? Because we, we decided, you decided, and I agreed, you know, a Grand Canyon, mm. which is, of course, a difficult subject matter, to right. say the least. Right. It's a very difficult subject So when you decided to do the Grand Canyon, how many trips and how much time did you spend there to just capture the, what we've captured. So I did there. three trips in a year and a half. Yes. And the first one, which was the Catalyst, I had never been there. And um, Scott Christensen, early early on, had said to me, um, don't go to the Grand Canyon to paint unless you've got five days to just sit and look at that place. Mm. Like, don't even try. Mm. You know, so I'd been putting it off, putting off, getting brush miles and experiencing Canyon Lands, mm -hmm. Dead Horse Point, which is closer. Yes. To home for me. Um, and you've painted that a lot. A lot. Um, so that's three hours away, Grand Canyon 6, which in Western terms is still relatively close to me. Right. And um, through the east entrance, which I love. Um, so that first trip, I thought, I'm not going unless I can really dedicate time. So I put aside 10 days. Mm. And I hiked for the first five. I mean, I think what Scott said was, was wise. You know, by the time I'd finished... I don't know how many miles I hiked. I hiked a ton. Um, I was finding ways in, finding ways in to interpret that scale, you mm -hmm. know. And then I started painting. And then I did two subsequent trips, um, but n neither of which repeated the drama of that August 23. Mm. August 2023. Monsoon season had come back to the Four Corners. I'm sure you experienced that too mm -hmm. after five years of being relatively mm -hmm. abnormal in terms of monsoon patterns and it was just this big celebratory kind of sense mm -hmm. if you live in the four corners southwest area like i do it's like the monsoons are back and i chose that window to go and i don't think i'll ever certainly the two subsequent trips they were useful for information gathering because there mm -hmm. were certain things i wanted to hone in on and get more information but in terms of that initial magic that first trip mm. i mean i remember that till i die mm. i mean just incredible you know the monsoonal action yeah. i saw the multiple rainbows i mean it was just jaw-dropping mm. yeah just incredible and so mm -hmm. very first time you've seen the grand canyon when mm. you went yeah that's good too um when you are on these trips to do the grand canyon and do you have you looked at other artists work to see how they have done it whether it's you know i mean there's so many people that have everybody's painted grand canyon whether right. it's moran or right you know i think i've been very very aware of how everyone handles the grand canyon and i'm aware of paintings of the grand canyon but as soon as you and i chatted after that first trip and i was like i want to produce a body of work I really made a point of not looking. I wanted it to feel like a private conversation of me mm. with that place, not feeling weighted down by all that's come before there. Yeah. And there's a lot. So that could be overwhelming, you know? Yeah, Constant and, comparisons. And it, I wanted and it to influence feel, you in right. ways that no, you I might wanted not it know. to feel kind of unique. Right. And this this is my conversation with this place. Yeah, it's really interesting to see all the takes on the Grand Canyon. They're all different. Right. And did you consider going, mm, I think I'll go down to the bottom and look at it from that component? I'd love to, but I didn't have the time. The time. Yeah. You know, three weeks on the river with yeah. a paint kit. Yeah, I mean, because yeah. it could, it is different. I mean, right. it's very different. I've handled, like Pete Nesbitt's done that a bunch of times. Okay. And his paintings are always very interesting. Yeah. Gregory Hall and, you know, the list goes on and right. on. You know. You know, some people that are just known as Grand Canyon painters, too, whether it's a Kurt Walters. Or, right, for you know, sure, yeah. And you're like, oh, okay. 
<laughs> is that intimidating at all when you know that there's these artists that have literally dedicated their life to one subject matter to it, some extent? It's, it's very intimidating, but I think as artists, you know, your journey, if you want to be authentic, I paint to understand the world around me. You know, so I feel just as legitimate going to the Grand Canyon and trying to understand it from my own perspective. Mm. And that's that's kind of the mindset I go with. I didn't go with this idea of, you know, producing a Grand Canyon themed show that happened to be a side product of something that quite magical that happened when mm. I was there, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I just think differently. So I think a lot of Grand Canyon... Obviously, scale mm -hmm. is one of the first questions that come up. How yeah, do you course. convey that scale? Or do you? And I was very aware that um, what I would call plane painters, right? They've got receding planes. So in the mm -hmm. foreground, you've got some maybe some cedar bushes, juniper trees with a piece of the rim. And then you've got some middle ground. And then you kind of recede with these planes. Um, and... The first day I set up, of course, I had this cedar tree just dominating the vista. And then the canyon pushed way mm -hmm. back there. And I thought, that's not how I want to understand this place. I want to get, like, right on the edge of the rim. So a lot mm. of those paintings, you don't have the foreground. Mm. Um, I wanted to get to the nuts and bolts of how that canyon is made and put together. Mm. You know, the geology of it. And you say you yeah. paint to understand the world around you. Yeah, how things are put together. Uh-huh, and what did you learn from the Grand Canyon? That it's complex and knobbly, and it's eroded in ways that, as a painter, you then have to manage. And I think that's why so many artists find it so challenging. There's things that don't behave according to normal rules there. Mm. Um, the local color of the geology, mm. you might... You know, we're taught as painters, keep your warm colors in the foreground and cool them off as you recede. Mm -hmm. Well, in the Grand Canyon, if the canyon's in front of you, you've got quite a lot of cool in that old granite blue-gray bedrock. You've mm. got a lot of cool colors, and then a lot of the real warm sandstone happens in the middle. Mm. And then if you're on the south rim looking north, the north rim has these very stripy layers of... Um, sandstone and limestone alternating very stripy very far away wants to catch the eye you know mm. so as an artist you have to manage these elements the canyon is 10 miles across <laughs> so atmospheric <laughs> perspective is huge there yeah and i found i think one of my light bulb moments was well wait a minute the canyon's also a mile deep so you've actually got atmospheric perspective happening two ways Right. You've got if you're on the rim looking down, particularly yeah. when you're above um, some of the rapids that are throwing up water vapor into the air. You've got atmospheric yeah. perspective happening down, as well as across. <laughs> so there were, you know, it needs to be managed and wrangled for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel like you did it? I feel like I began <laughs> a very um, thrilling conversation. Yeah. There you go. Okay. You know, and I think you know finishing a group of paintings for a show. I wasn't on a production line for this show. I wanted to explore a whole bunch of different ideas, different mm. questions in right. my head, and then curate them into somewhat of a uniform group. And it's always a little bit of sweet because you think, well, is this it? Is this the end of the conversation? And I, I know full well, you know, to be continued. Yeah. For sure. Uh -huh. Yeah. So it excited you. It excited you because I think to produce strong meaningful paintings you have to put on your editor's hat you know and mm. that takes time as an artist to get that confidence and ability to know how you can move things around and shift things but mm. it still feels very real mm -hmm. but it makes for a better designed painting um for instance the one that you were turning on right it's had charles picked up another one and did, did, did the same did thing really that's so funny yeah so it's like <laughs> that that kind of what we would call the no tan pattern between light and dark mm -hmm. and balance well were there some lights that i put in that weren't there you bet were there some darks that weren't there that i put in you bet mm -hmm. you know and therefore you're creating just in very simple terms this aesthetically um, pleasing pattern of lights and darks right. that technically should work any, yeah. well any that's your job up. as right. an artist right but i think as artists as you get more paint miles in that's what comes with experience 
Mm. You know, that's not what I would have been able to do 22 years ago no, when I not. first came to the States. You know, so yeah. you, you start growing in confidence, but that place will push you to be that editor more than other locations mm. will. Yeah. It needs it. Because Dixon would do that. As he got older, he edited more and more and yeah. more. Yeah. You know, you can see it in the choices that he made. Right. Right. You know, I, I was always such a purist, you know, I wanted to paint the landscape as it right. is. And I remember the first time I shifted a tree, you know, right. it just felt somehow very sinful. That's because you were did plein air, right? Right. And you were the president of the plein air? I was, I was just on the board. Well, yeah, the we board, had one yeah. president, four, four yeah. vice presidents. So, I, was, so, yeah, I mean, that of part of you was there like, oh, we have to do this. Is, I'm there to capture the image right. in that right. moment. Right. And so I could see why that would do right. it but you really so this felt like more of a a um, opportunity to put all this gained knowledge yes into um more um expressive pieces and by mm. expressive i don't necessarily mean the brushwork mm -hmm. i mean more expressive in terms of what i want to say about a place mm. yeah. what do you want to say about this place um well i think the one thing that comes across now that i see them all laid out yeah. is you're his one location, albeit a huge one, a singular theme for a show, and that just the variety of palette available. Mm, yeah, there I is. think just astonished me. I, I have not been able to see the whole group together out in the studio. Yes. And in fact, at one point, as the group was growing, I had to turn them all to face the wall because they were trying to talk to me too much. Ah. And they wouldn't let new pieces come along, you know, new right. pieces be exploratory. You know, they're wanting to talk to each other. And it's like, okay, I can't think of a show yet. Uh, you know, turn, yes. turn the older ones to face the it's wall. It's almost like cleaning your again. palate while you're eating, <laughs> right? right? I mean, right. you can't, it literally will affect the right. way you see yeah. the one you're working right. with. Right, but I think just sheer range. The sheer range of possibilities in that place. Just incredible. Yeah, and, yeah. In, and in yourself, right? Right, right. I mean, and ultimately, it this, those, right? this challenge, to me, the very first question that I had to come up with was, how do you build a relationship? Because a, a good painting is all about relationships of all these different elements. Mm. Here you have solid rock mm -hmm. juxtaposed to water vapor in the sky. And how do you get those two? You know, where do you find the common denominators between those two? Mm. You know, and it's through shape and color, but you still want one to feel like something solid and one to feel, mm. you know, a little bit more. Um, ephem ephemeral, you know, mm -hmm. but that was my very first question. Because, you know, when I painted something, it felt, you know, just from the get go, based on reality, it just, I've got to find more of a relationship between land and sky, mm. you know, when you're framing it on a canvas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, one of your favorite paintings is, or is maybe your favorite painting, is the one of the, the storm with uh, all the different, you know, light and water vapor and right. beer gun all right that. which we'll put up for those who are watching this or listening and not watching go to youtube because i'll put that painting up too in this conversation we're going to have you, about yeah. it so people can understand what we're talking about we'll do that for other pieces we talk about but that particular painting just maybe you could explain it. it's a bit larger painting yeah it's just 30 by 30 of a scroll it's from lip and point which is mm -hmm. one of the highest points in the park mm -hmm. so it's great when you've got these monsoon cells building to get a different perspective you know you, you can see this cell building from beneath you mm -hmm. essentially and one of the things i realized in the grand canyon that i really held myself to account throughout the whole thing was i think I've seen a lot of paintings where the shadows are just too dark, you know, mm. and they're clearly based on photographic evidence. Mm -hmm. And to me, the stunning thing when you're there is you have this canyon that is 10 miles wide with this huge expanse of sky above it. Those shadows you see so far into them, mm. you see so many different colors in them um, that I wanted to make sure that you see into the shadows and they don't just feel very dark and blue gray. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. to me, that was one of the um, constants, regardless of what I was seeing out there. Mm. And that squall piece, in the bottom left-hand corner, you have form shadow. Mm. And then I wanted to show what cloud shadows, what these scuttling cloud shadows look like going across the landscape. And they're very high key. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of light in them still. 
because you've got 10 miles expanse of sky <laughs> still shining into them, you right. know? So I think keeping those the values of those cast cloud shadows really high key mm. um, gives that piece a real sense of that kind of bright light. Mm, yeah, there is that sense in it for sure. Right. Yeah, no, it's a beautiful thing. The shadows out there just aren't very dark. As an yeah. artist, again, that's another rule that you have to kind of wrangle because as artists, you know, generally you're taught to keep your shadows simple, mm. not too much information in them. You know, shadows reveal form, whereas light reveals color and texture. Put all your information in the light planes. And I feel so often working in the southwest and the desert, I want to do the opposite. Mm. I feel like the light bleaches out and I feel like all the reflected light in the shadows reveals beautiful colors. Mm -hmm. You know, so I find myself wanting to kind of break that rule too. Right. You know, but okay. definitely to keep the key of the shadows a little higher was important for mm. me. And then there was another painting, which I thought was really one of your best paintings because it has two rainbows in it, right. partial rainbows. Right. And so often when I see artists do rainbows they just don't feel real you know the colors don't seem right and the, it just seems too in your face or right. something and that one didn't have that you, it was like oh yeah that's she actually really captured that i think putting a rainbow in a painting is like putting a figure in it that's where your eye wants to go it does right and um i didn't want it to go there i wanted the rainbows to be like a secondary narrative yes and the first, you know, that those those maces with the evening light hitting them win. Mm. It's got to win. And actually, as much as rainbows are delightful and distracting, they are never lighter in value than light hitting form. So they have to be knocked down internal value. And they are never more chromatic than light hitting local color and form. Mm -hmm. So they have to be secondary. And it's so hard. Because you want to chase all those beautiful <laughs> colors. Right. So it's like I actually, I painted everything else in that painting and just wiped out the rainbows. You know, terps on a rag, just get back to gessoed canvas and then key them in and yeah. make sure they were darker than that. That mesa, yes. you know, the bright orange yes. rock. Yes. And that the color there was kind of just nudged into place and wasn't too chromatic. Yeah. It's it hard to do. I, I mean, when I saw it, I thought, oh, that's really genius. Yeah. That's hard to do. Well, thank you. <laughs> I was pleased. That was my first rainbow attempt. So I was Ever? pleased with that. Ever. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It really worked. And I mean, again, when I see artists try this, it seems like more than often they don't really succeed. Right. I see. I see rainbows that are too too bright. Yeah. And they're, they're just, just like, yeah. Ow. And then, then everything else has to be in shadow for that to happen. Mm. Well, then, if everything else is in shadow, you don't have a rainbow because sunlight is required right. for that rainbow you to happen, have to happen, right? Yeah. So and then it, it feels a little off, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, well, thank you for that. Yeah, that's interesting. Your first rainbow. <laughs> My first. <laughs> one of two, actually. And then, then the second one is yeah. there's barely any hue in it at all, just a hint. And that's how that it is. Those colors though, are reversed, yeah. you know? that. Your, you know, that spectrum yes. appears in reverse on that second one. Yeah, just and, a hint. Of color and when you there. see those too, especially when it's like the rainbow is fading or just starting, either way, yeah. that's what it looks like. Right. Yeah. You know, it's not, it doesn't. It's, yeah. it's, I mean, I've looked at a lot of rainbows. Yeah. No, I wanted it to be secondary to the light hitting the mesa. Yeah, and it yeah, is the canyon wall. Yeah. 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 When I saw it, I go. Bravo, she did it. She oh, got it where you. it was. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I always like, oh, what are they going to be able to pull that off? I don't know. If, I'm just thinking, I don't know if Dixon ever did a rainbow. I'm just trying to think. He probably yeah, I can't did, think but I don't think. I think he... it's quite, you know, I think of myself, you know, and Dixon, a direct painter, right? You're yes. not indirectly building up layers. Um, so I think for direct painters, it's quite challenging. Mm. You know, if you're someone used to working in layers and, and glazes, you can kind of creep up on it. Yeah, Pete can for do a direct it. painter, it's a bit more challenging. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So what do you think you learned from this whole year and a half, you know, adventure? It's been, Canyon? it's really pushed me as a painter, I think. Um, Isn't that cool that I can great. do that after that many years of painting? Well. And teaching. I think, you know, I think, as you get more experience, somehow you become more true to yourself. Mm. Like, I, I just feel like I am gathering the tools that um, 
let me explain what my vision of the world is. It feels like the work's getting more personal like that. Mm. Um, I'm able to express more because I have more tools mm -hmm. through all that experience. So, um, but I'm very aware there's still a ton to learn. Mm. And I think to me, that's, motiv you know, motivation for a painter is never a problem because you're just so aware how much there is still to learn, you know. Do you find yourself? Fast. Do you find yourself becoming more present in the moment when you're painting than you did before? I I do. There's a part of me, um, you know, I have this nice studio and I love working on the bigger pieces. There's a part of me that just um, probably after this show just wants to get the plain air kit out mm -hmm. and for two weeks with no agenda, mm, you yeah. know, just follow your nose yeah. and paint anything. Just sit down and paint and rock. Mm. You know, I love getting back to the simplicity of just trying to observe something and paint it. And that's just fun in some respects. And I don't and I don't and I don't use the word fun easily because people will say that to me, Oh, you have a fun job. And I say, No, it's not fun, it's gratifying and there's real moments of happiness. Fun maybe not the right word, but when you're doing this just for yourself and playing with your muscle, your creative muscle. Right. It seems like there could be a sense of fun there. Am I am I overstretching? There's definitely a sense of being present. I uh, mean, you're really not aware of time passing. Yes. You know, and I think mindfulness of any kind is a is yes. a healthy place that we yeah. know makes us feel good. We all crave it, even if that comes from putting on a golf course. I imagine yeah. that same. <laughs> You know, that same level of focus that's required yes. um, is a nice place to be. Uh, that's a very good analogy because um, I do go putt to be present right. in the evenings. Do you? I do all the time. So do you choose putting over driving to be present? Which one is more Oh, bizarre? no, it's only putting. It's only putting. Yeah, because I'm alone by myself. I have a beautiful view of the mountain. Clouds are coming in and out. There's animals going around because nobody's going and putting at the end of the night. They're okay. all having their cocktails or whatever. Right. And it's you can let your mind just focus on what you're doing. Working on skill set too, but it's more than that. It's also just being in the moment. And it relaxes me Im immensely. Right. So that's probably very close to what you get when you right and I, I, I often talk about golf even though I don't play golf yeah. at all but to me to have a good game of golf you've got these very different skill sets. requirements yeah. you've got to be driving right on a good day you've got to be putting right yeah. on a good day and I think painting is the same mm. to end up with a good painting it's like you've got to have a really strong concept you know the idea I think I'm tuning into that a lot more now mm. that every painting starts with a, a strong idea or a strong question, mm. you know, and I was telling, I taught at the Booth Museum last week and I was telling my students, whenever you feel that doubt, that you have a question and you don't know the answer, hang on to the question, you know, because it's those questions, we're, we're all problem solvers, mm. you know, write, write the question down. Don't, don't get overwhelmed by that sense of not knowing, mm -hmm. but actually use, use that question as a catalyst for actually moving forward and solving that problem. Mm -hmm. But I do think painting is like golf. I mean, to get a good painting is like, yeah. The draw and and drawing you need has to be good. The yep. color harmony has to be good. The light and dark pattern has to be good. Mm -hmm. It has to connect with the edges of the canvas. And mm -hmm. the idea has to be good, you know? And it's like you're juggling all these it's different... It's true. And there's lots of subtles, subtleties in golf, too. Even just putting. So what's the slope? What type of grass? Is it... You know, is it longer or softer? Is it wet? Is it, or is wet? it drier? Yeah. You know, all these things right. come into play to making it, and you need repetitive skill set to make it work. It's muscle memory, just like it is with painting, I'm sure. You have to have it repetitively, do it over and over right. and over again. And it's interesting how fast you can lose it if you don't practice it. Right. And I find that I'll focus on certain things and certain facets will fall away. And you have to circle back around and say, okay, I'm going to work on my drawing for the next few months. Ah, you know. Same as golf. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. You're never going to get there yeah. to that perfect game. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's, it's impossible. Yeah, yeah it's no, it's, it's literally impossible. Right. That's why I think probably most creative people love it because they can't, you can't master it. You can only tame it. Right. In a way. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and then certainly as I grow as an artist, I'm more aware of, you know, 
things that I haven't known, and so it just adds greater depth of analysis right. to what you're considering, you know, and it's like, wow, <laughs> wow, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that has to be a mind blower when something, either another artist shows you something or you see something and go, I hadn't even thought about right. that. Right, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. you would think at this point in your career, you've been doing it a long time, right. and teaching art and, you know, observing art as a curator, that you would have seen most of it. But the reality is, I'm sure there's things that come up that just go. Hmm. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, I see and I say to my students, you know, you don't hear the answers until you have the question in your head, right? right. You don't know what you don't know, right? And then you have these epiphanies, and you're just like, wow. <laughs> no, it's true. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but that, I think that's why we're all still doing it, right? It's the chase. <laughs> yeah, the chase for <laughs> it's well, it's not for perfection. It's the because you can't reach perfection, but it's the chase for right. I don't know. You I think me. if you have a creative, inquisitive state of mind, then you know that painting is going to be immensely satisfying because you're never going to run out of questions and new ways of dealing with things. Right, or subject matter. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The only thing you run out of is time. That's right. That's it. Yeah. And then you're like... Which we have no control over. So. We have no control <laughs> over. <laughs> what? You know, if you're productive person and you're creating I think you don't ever want that to stop right even when you know for whatever reason it is going to stop somehow right. you go it can't stop right how can it stop I'm not I haven't done enough right I right wanna... and that was my reaction three years ago you know with the whole breast cancer diagnosis was my immediate reaction the wor first words that came out of my mouth was I'm not done yet Right. You know, like, right. I, I'm not done. I want to keep going. Yeah. Yeah. There's more for me to accomplish. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, no, I see that. You yeah. know, Ed, when he was, he was ill and I was talking to him a few weeks before his death, he was, he had a painting on the easel he couldn't finish. And it was like, oh, I just want to finish that painting. And, yeah. And he had a show for me and, you know, he had wanted that painting to be in the show for me. But I was just like, you've done enough. Yeah. You, you, it's okay. Right. But, you know, is that drive of I've got to keep doing it. Right. You know, you hear it. Richard Spivey was this great pottery expert. Hmm. And he liked, we'd buy and sell things together too. He's in hospice and I'm calling him from a show talking about, you know, the pots and things. And he's like, oh, what is, is there anything we can co-venture together? I thought, wow, I want to be that. Yeah, right. You know, exactly. he's still in there fighting. Yeah. yeah. You know, he's, yeah. whatever, it still captures him. You know, he hasn't given up the quest. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It will always keep us moving forward. It's great. And Dixon's great last big have. piece is the Grand Canyon. Is that right? Yeah. He, okay. Yeah, he did it for a mural for the LA wow. Canal Railroad. Yeah, huge, big piece. Yeah. And he had to have some other artists do it, and he did part and lay it out and directed him. But it's interesting. That was his last piece. I'll be going about. back for sure. I think the thing that struck me was, you know, you hear all these horror stories about Grand Canyon, Canyon Village and how huge it is. Mm. Well, you put a backpack on and a pair of hiking boots, you can get away from that. Quickly. Whole circus, really quickly. Yeah. It's very, very special. Yeah. Or go yeah. to the north side of the canyon, I guess. Right. Too. But even the sunrises, you know, the tree piece. Yeah, a max of three of us out there, you know, and of course the bit I omitted from my story was the th other three people that were out there were all taking selfies against the rising bullseye of the sun, <laughs> which you know unless there's clouds or something going on, it's like it's not much to look at, you know, it's just a rising bullseye that's gonna blind you, and uh -huh. uh, that was the title of that painting, you know, everyone's looking east, and I'm like the real magic's in the west at sunrise. You know, and that's where the title came from. Uh, I even had people approach me going, it's so sad you're here by yourself because you have no one to take your photo. No, and I'm like, really? it's not about me. It's about this. Yeah, well, <laughs> there's been a lot incredible. of deaths on the Grand Canyon right. from people right. getting the selfies and not being aware enough that they're on the edge of right. the yeah. oblivion. Right. You know, what, yeah. what does it say as, as, of us as a society? Right. That we're so self -absorbed. But yeah, I got a lot of, they weren't interested in what I was doing. They None. just felt None. sad that I didn't have anyone to take my photo. Really? That's <laughs> what they were. Like, that's <laughs> not about yeah. me. Apparently, those were not buyers. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Were they younger people? Or? Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Yeah. Don't see the world. But yeah, I mean, at mm. sunrise, wherever I was, there'd be two or three people, or I'd be by myself. I mean, just incredible. You can get away from the crowds there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if you make the effort. And yeah. Do things. Even different. somewhere like Mother Point, you know, where the big visitor center is yes. and everything. Just walking 10 minutes along there with a paint kit. Yeah. Yeah. It's you uh -huh. can have a very special day. Uh -huh. so. Unless there's a good selfie point right there. And right, they're, right. They're going to go and do it. I'd get interrupted to take people's photos. Ah. Uh, you know. And sometimes they're just completely oblivious of what you're doing, right? right? They literally, you're in the moment. Right. You're focused. Right. And they will literally stop you to say, right. can you take our photo? Right. And there was one day where uh -huh. I, I was at Lippin Point where the school painting is. And I'd walked away back to my truck to get a bottle of water or something. And I came back and there was a tourist there and she'd actually picked up my paintbrush, was pretending to paint on the canvas and her friend was taking her photo. What did you say? I just laughed. I literally laughed out loud. I was so gobsmacked by that. It's just just like... no awareness. Zero. See, yeah. but that's the problem, I think, in, in our world, actually, is we're all want to talk about ourselves and mm. nobody wants to listen right you know and right. it's about you know answering these questions but you have to listen to know how to answer them. yeah and, and that's always the balance i think in paintings because is it 100 percent about the subject matter or is it 100 percent about the artist or is it somewhere on that huge spectrum in between mm. and i love getting a sense of the artist you know if it's too mm fully rendered and it's too much of that you know mm. like a topographical rendering right um I, I love getting a sense of who that artist is and what Absolutely. they reacted and i love you know i want to get that in my work but i still want that feeling that it's not about me it's about me celebrating that place mm. you know so the, but that the, is getting you over. see that's getting you right when you're celebrating that place it's because you're celebrating which is your emotion I know. which is coming right. out true. on the, true yeah it, it is yeah. i mean you can, i but i think the more you look at art i've gotten to the point where i can really look at paintings and i get a sense of what that artist was feeling you know, it's just like an, on a basic level of angst or anger or happiness or whatever it is. You can see it in paintings. Right. You know, I'm sure right. I can see it in yours. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I generally tend to paint things that I feel really positive and mm. I, I want those paintings to feel celebratory. Mm -hmm. If I'm in the dark phase, I don't tend to. I'll go and paint plain air because that will keep me sane. But. I don't mm. tend to want to explore that on canvas. It, it, so most of my paintings mm. <laughs> um, tend to, you know, mm -hmm. I hope they feel happy mm -hmm. and joyous. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. That's what you want to be remembered as. Right. Yeah. 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 No, it's tough to do those dark paintings. Sometimes yeah. they really hurt. I right. can see them in a, in a Fritz shoulder. I mean, yes. some of his are just. Right. God. And Dixon's Depression era paintings. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Some of those are just, yeah. Yeah. You can feel it. even Even his landscapes, you know, the, the subjects that he chooses and the colors and the way he does it, you can see, okay. Yeah. You know, because he went through serious depression. Right. You know, on a regular basis his whole right. life, I think, until really maybe until he got to his, his late, you know, 60s kind of time frame when he moved to Tucson and stuff. And you grow as a person, you, I think you can work those things out to some extent. Right. Hopefully, or you don't. <laughs> yeah. And then you stop growing. Yeah. When you stop growing, you're toast. Right. So, are we talking still about art? I think so. <laughs> of course we are. Art is life. Life is art. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Yeah. So, what's uh, what else? Anything else we should talk about? This show opens soon. We open next Friday. Next Friday, yep. Yeah. The beauty thing about this podcast, even though it's about this show, this podcast lasts forever hopefully i mean right. in the sense that we're talking about not just the specific show which is going to be wonderful and i can hardly wait for it but the idea is it's you as the artist and what that is and what it takes to do a show for you i'm sure all your shows and some component are like this am i wrong or not yeah i mean it's a very distinct chapter of a year and a half yeah. and it doesn't matter how organized you are the last few months are intense mm. because it's all coming together so mm. there's paintings that were there from the outset that stand the test of time 
There's others that you now understand more because you've been working your way through this mm. knowledge base mm -hmm. for a year and a half and you understand them more. You think you can do them better, mm. um, resolve an idea a little bit more. So it's this growth. It's it's this incredible thing. And it doesn't matter how structured and disciplined you are about the time. The last three months are intense. Yeah. Yeah. Because of the... And I will always go down to the wire, you know. But is that <laughs> because like, the... It's... I need to have this X amount of paintings. Just trying to figure out that... Literally that time that it takes to get there. Right. Yeah. There's so many moving targets involved. Yeah. And there's paintings that didn't make the grade for the show. There's paintings that um, are still marinating in my head. Mm. You know, they're half worked out. But you have a deadline, you know, and it's yeah. like, and you want the group to feel unified. You're aware of that at mm. the end, you know. Um, so, yeah, but I don't think it's a conversation that's finished, you know. Mm. It's always bittersweet, um, you know, when you get to that deadline and then you release the work. It's a great relief. Yeah, I'm sure. But then you miss <laughs> the conversation and you're like, okay, I'm going to go back. Now you got to do I'm going to yeah, go back and right. carry on that conversation. And so yeah. that literally was the first time you'd seen all your paintings laid out was... Yeah. 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 I mean, in my studio, they had to be on flat surfaces and, right. you know, in, in glary light. So, yeah. And often the, not with a frame. and Right. So... Right. And uh, so, yeah, this is the first time of seeing them in really nice gallery <laughs> lined up. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah and for great. us, the fun part now for me will be, okay, I get to look at this body of work and I'll sit like you sit with your tree, right? You sit with your tree and you yeah. think. So I will sit with your paintings and try to think, okay, how do they work as a group and right. coalesce? Right. So when I put them on the wall, it feels, there's a beat to it right there's right. A, it's like a music whatever it is well you always do a great job of hanging too i remember my last show i just walked in and it really you know yeah. it was really an emotional moment because uh, you just do a beautiful job with the hang yeah and normally you know i like controlling how my work I'm is sure. presented i'm sure and i don't feel like that with you guys it's just trust you know i yeah. trust you implicitly to present them beautifully yeah. and in ways that i might not have done and that's I'm really sure. that's really nice for me yeah i'm sure in fact it would not be the way because you would see things from a, there's different ways you would look at it maybe even from the mechanical way that you painted them or whatever sure. and i'm literally going strictly on emotion right you know yeah and and to some extent if the frames are not the same, then I have to take that into consideration. But right. most artists are aware that, you know, don't give me a bunch of odd looking shaped frames right. that I have to then torture myself. Well, to my frames make are this. totally consistent across this the makes board on this show. Hanging it does, I'm so sure. Yeah. Much easier. Right. Get, you know, you you come in with three or four different types of frames of colors and sizes and subject matter and you're like, Oh man, how do I make this work? <laughs> You right. know? <laughs> yeah. No, it becomes a different beast. Yeah. Yeah. Now yours are easy because of that. Then it's just literally, it's emotion. I just I don't know how to explain yeah. it. And it's not just me too. You know, I'll have Gabriel and you know take his input and we'll set it up and right. it'll generally it's like a puzzle and it comes together pretty quickly. Sure. Like and you get certain paintings that talk to each other. Yes. You know, so they kind of Absolutely. raise each other up or they initiate a kind of narrative that maybe I didn't even think of yes. was a common denominator between yes. those two pieces. Yes. So, and sometimes you don't yeah. want too much things similar in the same beat. Totally. You know, right. need to be, and like you have two bigger paintings that need to be separated. They need to balance the wall. Right. So one here, one there, and then fill in. Yeah. So those are the first pieces that get set up. I mean, the tree piece to me is the center piece. You know, because whatever it is, just is. So, you know, it'll be the one that goes under the title. Okay. So that's how I see it. Well, again, don't yeah. know until you literally ruminate and look and sit. I'll let, sometimes I'll just sit there for, you know, uh, as much as an hour and just, oh, wow. yeah, just try to play with the different things and walk back. And for, sometimes it's easier, sometimes it's harder. Well, it but, shows in your presentation. The yeah, I hope now sure, watch yeah. this one. Be like, like, <laughs> Depression oh my now. God. Eh, I had some stuff I got to do. <laughs> Hang it up. It'll be fine. Right. I'm sure there are gallerists that do just go, you know, just they don't take that right. time. I hope 
probably not many. Most, I think, probably are pretty careful about that. They also recognize that artists, you know, it's so disappointing for an artist to have a bad hang, you know, when they come in. I know that. Well, I... I've particularly with the museums. group shows you know the yes. salon shows where there's a lot of artists that are going to be represented i literally i've had nightmares where mm. you walk into you know you've traveled two days to see the show and you walk in and you're like where's my work and yes. they were like oh, well we hung it above the photocopier in the office you yeah know? no <laughs> i mean right. that's the kind of thing that you have panic attacks yeah. about you know no, or, it's true or it's kind of way up with glare on it and you're just like wow or how <laughs> okay. they who they hung you next to or how they hung it right. Or, right yeah no that's usually where i see artists in museum shows are like oh yeah you know oh, yeah that the... and it's painful i mean i literally have those kinds of dreams where you're just oh like, i can see it <gasps> Yeah, there was yeah. a sculptor that was, I won't say this show, but it was, he was there and I, he was in agony basically because they had put the sculpture completely the wrong way. Wow. Even in the thing, he said, you know, I, wow. you know this is how it's supposed yeah. to be. You know, it's wrong. Right. And it's not. <laughs> right. And trying to get somebody to correct it was, you know, difficult for them. Yeah. And they did, but, you know, it's like. He had the bad dream, but it came to fruition for him. <laughs> so anyway. Yeah, I think being in the back office uh, above the photocopy, I've had that one several really? times. Really? <laughs> like, uh, yeah. Yeah, that yeah. sucks. But, but really you sucks. know, it's uh, one thing being by yourself in the studio is your own biggest critic, you know, and then when yes. you, it's that process and you hear, you hear songwriters and you hear actors talk about this. It's when it goes from being yours to being everybody else's right. there's a there's a transition there and um you don't have control over that you know no. so yeah yeah once it's put out there you yeah you either can't worry yeah about it, you know and that is just like an actor or, right. or a writer or whatever yeah. it's like okay it's not mine anymore yeah and people can decide what they want about it but yeah i'm and I'm, move on to the next subject whatever that is right i'm sure your mind once you finish that last painting you're done and it's your mind is like clicked a little differently probably yeah you know, you'll work on things, other things, which you've said you're going to. I was to. explaining to my students, because one of the themes that came out of this show in terms of structure mm. is um, pattern, you know, repeating patterns, finding unity through repeating shapes mm -hmm. in some of those, um, you know, the shadows. And um, I was telling my students, you know, I can feel an exploration I want to do of the forest. And to me, that's very connected to the Grand Canyon show, even though... The subject matter couldn't be more different, but it actually kind of applies a lot of the, what I would say, the rhythm language, what I learned in this show mm. about rhythm and repeating things to the forest. It's the same thing to me, mm. you know, same concept, same language, mm -hmm. very different subject matter. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Yeah, but it, it is, but it isn't. It's just the, yeah. the imagery is different, but the, the structure is the same. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, anything we didn't talk about? I think we covered it. We covered it a lot, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, you're are you now you're headed to Scottsdale to go teach? No, I'm hanging right. out here for the week. Oh, the whole week. Yeah. Oh, that's and then fantastic. I'm teaching in Scottsdale next week. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, on the All way right. back home. Yeah. So we're gonna have some rain coming in, I think, this weekend. Yeah. So you might get some killer clouds. It's all good. I mean, I was yeah. driving from winter into spring, so yeah. It's just a beautiful yes. time to be here. Eighty yeah. today, I think. Eighty yeah. something. Yeah, no, it's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Tucson's fantastic. End of March through April and early May. Yeah, it's a great time so, to be here. So yeah. You know, you want people to come and visit. Just visit. You don't have to stay. Visit. Right. <laughs> yeah. No, I'll be doing some hiking and some painting. Oh, yeah. Good for yeah. you. Yeah. Get some yeah. Sabino stuff, too. Yeah. yeah. It's just, uh, I always love Sabino stuff. And the Catalinas are just made for, you know, shadows and things. It changes constantly. Right. Not, as you know, I don't right. have to tell you that. You're, yeah. I mean, you're very intuitive and introspective, and you'll be out there looking. No, so. it won't be. It won't be hard. No. Um, filling my time. For no, the next it week. won't. <laughs> All right, very good. Real. Thank you so much, All right. Mark. I appreciate it. Uh, absolutely. Appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, it's great. yeah, no, yeah, yeah. No. It's it's gonna be fun to hang it. That's the next part for me. I can, I'll work on that today as well. Okay. Just trying to so the next time you come in, whatever day it will, it'll be done. Great. So all right. Thank Jill you Carver. so much. Thank appreciate you. It. All right. Okay. Yes.